Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Mauricio Lastres. I am a racing driver and racing and engineering coach. And I want to welcome you to my second episode of driving and talking with racers. In today's episode, we're talking to a road racer who's turned NASCAR driver. Let's meet him. All right, so here we are from Richfield, Wisconsin, the man who turns laps around the track so quickly. Who is he? Josh Balicki. Hey, Josh, thank you for joining me. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> um, so let me, again, I just want to review um, some of the highlights. I know um, you basically, you know, you started karting like uh, most everybody else. Then very quickly as an early teen, you made your way onto cars. You started uh, racing spec Miatas. Yep. And then um, I think that was in 2011, started racing Spec Miata with SCCA and touring the country. And, you know, you got had a lot of success there. And then um, in 2012, what happened in 2012? You had, uh, you had some good years there. I think it was 2014 that was a pivotal, uh, pivotal year. And then in 2015, started uh, making your way up to uh, some bigger pro-level races. You, I know that you raced in... Um, the Continental Tire Sports Car Championship. Yep. That year, you made two or three starts. Yeah, we, we made two starts in and the uh, Bur yeah in the Burton Racing BMW. And my first race, which was at Road America, we led eight laps, so that was pretty cool in front of my home crowd. Yeah, that was a big race. I remember watching it uh, on an iPad. I was in Miami, and uh, it was pretty exciting. Yeah, you guys uh, took the lead for a good portion of it. Had some excellent strategy and had the cautions. Had the yellows lined up perfectly for you. You guys would have had an awesome finish. Just a little uh, bad luck on that one. And yeah. then and then you raced at uh, um, Circuit of the Americas. And then the following year, you know, things just kept on building every year. Last year, you made your um, Xfinity debut you made your you broke into nascar not only did you rate it race on the road courses you made your oval debut as well yeah and then you probably thought like man how could it get any better than that and then this year you made your monster energy cup debut you raced at new ham uh, you raced at sonoma in in monster energy cup you raced at new hampshire in monster energy cup and you've made about what is it now four uh starts in the xfinity series this year uh yeah. five starts right now five right? starts and um, and then obviously you know uh, the big the big one was uh, the Road America finish where you got uh, the best finish probably of the season for the team is that true you finished twelfth yeah we finished twelfth and that was obviously my best career finish but that was one of the best finishes for the team too so it was a uh, you know it was a really cool weekend again at my home track uh, year from my NASCAR debut in 2016 so it was just a great weekend a lot of family a lot of friends there. Yeah, that, that, that was awesome, and I was also watching the Mid-Ohio race, and the thing is that you didn't get the finish that you deserve on that one, and I was watching it, and had you just, there was that last wreck that happened, and I, was, and I said to myself, if Josh makes it through this, he's in the top 15, like, the, that's a done deal, you may have even been, like, close to a top 10, and, yeah, uh, yeah but it's just typical NASCAR, it was a, <laughs> it was a pileup, so. Yeah, I think we would have had a top 10, I really do, um. But, you know, I saw a gap, and that gap closed, and I probably should have went on the grass. But, you know, as a race car driver, you see a gap, and you go for it. And when the gap closes, there's just really nothing you can do. So Mid-Ohio was crazy. That track's really tight and technical, and those cars just don't like that track. It's just so tight. I enjoy the track. A lot of those drivers don't. Um, but it was a lot of fun, so good learning experience. Yeah, no, I mean, the finish obviously doesn't reflect uh, how you guys ran, and the potential was there just to match the same as Road America. So, um just you know getting caught up in, and and it's just statistics you know if you're going to be racing nascar you're going to be get, getting caught up in pileups there's nothing to do. yeah um so uh, i guess I, I just want to give a little bit of history to uh the fans watching first of all we, we have met before and we actually raced together in the 2014 uh 25 hours of thunder hill and yeah. for anybody that thinks that racing is very glamorous and all this and that uh i believe that you were sleeping on an air mattress in my apartment the the weekend that weekend before we headed out to the track and uh uh do you have any memories of that time i think uh, we, we did some touring of san francisco and obviously the race itself wasn't that good but uh we had a, we had a fun time yeah it was a lot of fun you know that was my first time in san francisco area and, you know, like you said, I, I stayed in an air mattress in your um, living room, which I appreciate that. But, you know, you came to me with the opportunity to race that race. And, 
it's a 25 hour endurance race and you know we had I think we had five drivers in our car so you know split it up we did about five hours on average each driver um, I think on lap or an hour four or five we blew up the motor so our team were actually all high school students because our team owner was a uh, high school teacher in the uh, shop class you know auto class so we uh, blew the motor up you know I think it was just a mechanical failure and we swapped engines, you know, thanks to the, the crew. I think in like an hour and a half, we were back out on track. Obviously, that put a big, you know, hole. We, we weren't competitive then. You know, we couldn't go for the win, but we could still turn laps and just gain experience, which is exactly what we did. So it was a lot of fun. It was a great weekend. You know, we both had fun. That was my first time actually meeting you in person. And, you know, hopefully it won't be the last. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, it, it was a great fun. Um, do you have any other, like, cases where you've had to, like, uh, you know, I think – I, I know, like, last year, like, Glenn McGee was uh, racing in uh, the MX-5 Cup, and he was sleeping in the trailer and all that. And uh, I don't know, do you have any more, like, cases where, you know, it's not as glamorous as people think it is? Oh, yeah. I mean, growing starting up. Starting out, especially. Yeah, yeah. Growing up, my dad and I, you know, we traveled to the races ourselves. We did all of our own mechanical work to the car. And, you know, we slept in an air mattress almost every weekend in the trailer, unless it was 100 degrees out, you know, then you buy a, buy a room. But... You know, I don't mind sleeping on an air mattress, and, you know, I've done it, you know, probably over 100 times. You know, we've been racing for over 16 years now, and, you know, there's obviously the glamorous side, and, you know, you see that on TV, you know, watching NASCAR, but now you kind of see, um, or at least I'm experiencing the not-so-glamorous side, you know, whether it's sleeping in, um, you know, in a trailer, in, a, in, a, in an air mattress, or, you know, just, just being around the crew, and, you know, thrashing in the car you know a lot of people don't experience that and racing isn't just all glamour it's yeah. a lot of hard work yeah and we're going to talk more about that I, I do love the stories you know i'm a nascar fan too and i, I love stories of mark martin and all the stuff that he did when he was uh working his way to try to make it to the big leagues but he was sleeping in the gar garage in the shop in indiana i think they're uh, what is it north liberty uh indiana and he called it north misery and it was just frigid cold, no heating, nothing, and he was just freezing. Like, he could have died out there, but that was what he had to do. It was crazy. Yeah, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. So we're going to uh, we're gonna take off. We're in the Xfinity car. Um, we did practice for this, I believe, a year ago. And we, we, uh, when you were preparing to do your um, Trans Am debut, and that, yeah. that very suddenly turned into a Xfinity d debut, uh, because yeah. that deal kind of broke down, but we did a little bit of practice uh, online a little, bit, you know, a year and a few months ago, and uh, I guess we're going to recreate that. But this is your home track, you know. You have tons of experience here. You've been coaching here for years. You've been racing here for years. So um, I think let, I'm going to follow you around, and then let's talk about the real track. Let's talk about how uh, the iRacing one compares to it, and let's talk about uh, I guess the secrets of Road America from you know one of its best experts. Perfect. So let's let's go on track. Now, what car are you driving today? I'm driving the Extreme Experience uh, Chevrolet Camaro. It's number eight. This is the car that I actually raced here and finished 12th in. So same livery, same design. Um, you know, it's pretty cool. Chevrolet Camaro. And it's really cool how iRacing really replicates the track and the cars. You know, all the tracks and cars are really just scanned, so everything's pretty much dead accurate. So head out right now. Yeah, let's go. You can see my car? Yeah, I see it. Okay, cool. Coming out on cold tires, uh, especially with these big cars, it's a bit of a challenge. You just have so much more power on the not a lot of brakes, so that's a big thing. you got to keep up. There's been a lot of stuff in America on that race. Yeah. Yeah, it's very important to hear what the what it, car is like on the tires. Yeah. What I noticed is that I racing car. You know, it actually handles a lot better on that racing. You can uh, really run the car a lot harder in the corner. And even even the brakes, the car brakes a lot better. You know, I can get away with breaking the four hard for turn five. Where in real life when you did that you need the tire wall. You have to brake more all the markers. So that's one thing I noticed is the big difference. Um, a lot of every, everything else is pretty accurate, but the way the car handles through the corner, it's, it's pretty spot on. And once you start getting on older tires, um, you know, that's, there's a lot of similarities there. The 
pink in these cars is pretty sketchy. It's fast, it's fast corner. You see a lot of people going off track in the pink. before my NASCAR career, you know, it's funny, the you know, long story show, for short, um, I just basically messaged the NASCAR team a week before the race because we were supposed to race a Trans Am Series race, which is a support series for NASCAR that weekend, and obviously we had some issues with the car, so I wanted to race still, so I, I basically messaged the NASCAR team, and they said, you know, let's call, call our team manager, and we, we put the deal together, but at the time, you know, I had no NASCAR experience, and I didn't have a lot of experience in these big heavy cars, so... You know, it's cool. It, it, it really helps, you know, iRacing. And, you know, going back and forth, you know, when I, when I drive this stock car, and I come back to iRacing, I'm actually faster than I am previous. So it, it just shows how, how you know, well sorted out iRacing is. And I, I really think this is the best, you know, racing simulator on the planet. Yeah, me too, right? And, and I, I do spend a lot of time on the forums, and, you know, people like to talk about a lot of things and complain, but there's no chance that I'll use anything else because of... I mean, more than anything, it's just the racetracks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, going back to the racetracks and laser scanning everything, you know, they do laser scan everything. So being around Road America, I can point out bumps in the track where, you know, other NASCAR drivers, people who just come there, you know, once or twice a year can't, can't point those bumps out. Or, you know, just points of reference to, you know, breaking points, uh, turning points, turning marks. And it's pretty cool because iRacing really replicates that. With, with laser scanning the track, you have everything there. So, you know, I've coached clients before before we actually are in real life at the track on right. iRacing. Uh, uh, okay. All right, so, so we're loading, and now we can talk about this. So, so we're, we're loading up a new track, so we're going to do a little bit more practice. But um, where are we? What are we doing? Um, we are going to race Dover. We're going to practice in Dover. So Dover is a... Uh, the Monster Mile, they call it. It's a very fast track, high bank track. Um, I don't know what the banking is, but you know, average speed around the track is I think around 160, which is fast for an Xfinity Series car. Um, it's uh, it's a really tight track. It's not like Daytona where it's super wide, and it, it can bite. You know, I just watched a replay of last year's ra or not last year's, but earlier this year's race because they visited this this racetrack twice. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of experienced drivers, you know, into the wall just because it's such a tight track and, you know, it's hard to go double file around the corners. And there's actually some elevation, too, which is weird for an oval, but going into turn one and turn three, you actually drop off. So I don't know if they dug into the, the land, you know, obviously make the banking, but it's pretty cool because even on iRace, you know, you can tell you drop off probably, you know, I would guess 10 or 20 feet at, at least. And I've heard stories of, you know, pit crews or, or teams saying, you know, once the car goes in that divot, they can't even see the top of the car anymore. So I'm excited. You know, we're actually racing there this weekend in the community series for BJ McLeod, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're here practicing today. Okay, so um, I guess I set the track for morning conditions and relatively clean because I know that uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that maybe the trucks have already been out there and everything. So there's not that much rubber out there. It's still the morning. So this is going to try to replicate a little bit more of uh, the conditions that you might have um, when you guys are starting out the, the race weekend. Okay. Okay. Uh, did you load up your uh, Dover setup? Yep. Yep. Okay. I am good. All right. So uh, I guess let's try to head out like the, no the way that you normally would on a practice and then also try to use me as your crew chief. And um, I guess I want to hear the type of feedback that you normally give. Um, and, and you know, communicate what you're feeling with the car and everything. Let's just handle it as if it was uh, the first practice. Cool. So yeah, I mean, going out first practice, a new track. You know, you don't want to be too aggressive out there. Um, but you also have a short amount of time to know what the car is doing. So for practice, you have to stay all around the apron around the corner. And you can just tell right now, you know, by looking at the at the corners, they're they're high bank, it's fast track. So this track does not require any brakes. 
drive to the corner hard. Let's do a few laps. Let's you know, get comfortable with the car, see what the car's doing. Normally, right away, start experimenting with your race lines. No, I think that I just lines off a little bit. Um, you know, watching YouTube videos, a lot of these guys are on the bottom for the most part of the race, and they kind of start looking for more grip. They come up a little bit, but I think we'd probably for sure see the bottom. We're working our way up, getting up every lap. Oh, okay, now I'm starting to feel some over, understeer. Yep. I, I got in the wall gonna, a little bit. I was, I was actually literally just going to say, so right now I'm feeling the car is a lot of oversteer or understeer, um, you know, almost everywhere in the corner. And from what I hear, this is the track that drivers would rather have understeer, but obviously I think the amount of understeer we're feeling is more than we really want. Um, yeah, especially off the truth. That's where, man, it got me last time. Um, so are you... All right, let's, let's, let's come in. Um, I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're NASCAR drivers right now, so I don't know what we're talking about over under steer. We're talking push, the car's pushing. Yeah, the car's pushing, it's tight. So it's really easy to speed on pit lane. Yeah, let's just go ahead and go into a garage. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's funny, that push came real quick and it came for both of us like at the same time. I bent up yeah. my uh, spy optic Chevrolet. Okay. So, um, I used to race a lot on ovals. I used to be, it's funny, um, I mean, talking about real life and right? right? Uh, not in real life, but my first race car experience was on an oval. And then uh, on the sim, I spent years of only driving ovals. So really, I'm more of a convert of oval racing than to road racing than the other way around. And I used to be really, really good at the setup stuff. But now it's been so, so long that I don't know what the, like, I can't make heads or tails out of this stuff. Like normally what I would have done, I either, you know, soften up the front and like raise the track bar immediately or, or add a little bit of a cross weight or something. But track bar adjustment is something that I would probably do in a circumstance like this. What do you think? I agree. I think the first change, you don't want to make anything too aggressive right now because the car wasn't terrible. Um, so I think we should make a track bar adjustment. So. To be honest, I don't even know where the track bar is. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Like, I, I, I used to race the ovals back in NASCAR 2003, you know, so, so then it was easy. But I, I see there's a left and right uh, track bar height at the bottom screen there. Yep. And, like, the default one says plus 216. Well, I have it in millimeters. So uh, plus 8.5 inches. So we can raise that up a little bit. And that, that should help us center off, I think. Yeah, I'm going to raise it to 9. Okay. What other changes do you guys normally play around with your practices? Um, in practices and in the race, you know, we kind of deal with tire pressures a lot. Usually, we're actually running used tires for the most part. We're buying them off of some teams, and our first practice usually we come with tires from home, meaning they already have some laps on them, so they're not the best. So it's real difficult to get a gauge on what the car is doing with those types of tires because a good example is that Chicagoland, we had some really old tires in, uh, in practice. And the car was it, was, it was pretty bad. And we made a lot of changes. We put brand new tires on for qualifying. And immediately we jumped up 10, 10 spots. You know, 10 spots is huge. And it was a big difference. And, you know, the car had more in it too. Um, so it's really hard to gauge. Obviously right now in iRacing, tires are always brand new. You know, your first laps. So it is, that's one good thing. So, you know, we raised the uh, track bar. But we'd also maybe make uh, a uh, pressure adjustment to the tires. Do you want to make a pressure adjustment to it? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Okay, let, let, let's do that then too. Right now we're at what, 52 PSI, both front yep. and rear on the right side. What do you want yeah. to do? Uh, there are hot 58s. The right front, obviously. Yeah, my, my right front got up to 58 and my uh, right rear was 56. Yeah, my, mine was too, so. Let's lower them. To 51. Okay. Just 
Both front and rear, or only the front, right front? Uh, front and rear. Okay. Let's just try that. Okay. I'm sorry. I went the wrong way. We should probably add pressure. We want the car to rotate better. Okay. Is that correct? Um, I think it might make the, I, I think the, the balance, uh, I, I, I think the right front being a little bit warmer already just with like three la laps is a little bit of a concern. I mean, uh, the, so we raised the track bar, so that's going to help. Um, yeah, if we raise the tire pr pressure on the right side, it's going to increase that stagger a little bit. So it will make the car, you know, the outside radius of the, the right side tires a little bit bigger than the left. And that'll make it rotate a little bit better. It's just whether or not we're going to be overheating that right front. That's my only concern. Yeah. So, I mean, we could either just make a change to the right rear the and rear. leave the right front the same. And, and yeah, let's bump the, yeah, let's bump the right rear up uh, a full pound. Okay. Right now, it's two full pounds um, less. So, what do you have your your right rear at, then? Right rear started out at 52, uh -huh. and I'm at 53.5. Okay, 53.5, and then your right front is at 52? 52.5. Okay. All right, that sounds good to me. Let's try that. Let's try that. All right, see how that is. So one thing I noticed is I'm a lot better at talking and driving on the road courses than I am on the ovals. I'm still learning a lot with the ovals, you know, every time I go out there. I, I think that just shows I'm a lot more comfortable with road courses than I am with ovals. But, you know, you fix that just by taking some time. That's right. And what was your real life experience on ovals before you got the call to run Phoenix? I think it was your first one. Uh, my first home race was actually uh, a short track race in a sportsman. So a sportsman is a uh, purpose-built race car, not a lot of power, and it's big and heavy. So it's not like a late model, it's quite a bit slower, but I ran a quarter mile track at Jefferson Speedway. And we ran four races in 2012, so it's um, been a long time obviously since then. But Phoenix was definitely it's a bit of an eye opener. <laughs> Um, it was a tough track, the equipment we had wasn't the best, so you know, you just wanted to stay out of the way. And it was championship night too, you know, it was one night from the uh, championship decider, so you knew guys were going to be racing hard, they weren't. And you know, we walked away with the 28th place finish, which I feel like was respectable for, uh, for my first oval, the team, and everything else. So hopefully we can go back this year, because Phoenix was a really fun track. Yeah, no, that was a great finish, I know that you guys were really happy with that at the end of that. Um, I'm noticing, like, talk to me what you're feeling in the car, and, and, and you said that you're not using the brakes at all, right? Yeah, you, you know, I've talked to many different drivers, and this track does not require brakes. Um, you know, maybe just a little bit, just to boost your confidence, but it's just like a Chicago line, you know, I last week on iRacing, I experimented with, uh, with a little bit of brakes on iRacing, and I got to the track, and you never want to touch the brakes. You so, don't think that they're fucking with you, right? No, no, it's my team owner. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, right now I think the car's a little bit tight, still. More so in turn two, right? I mean, I feel like exiting turn four, I'm like the car's actually not too bad, but turn two is like, plow city. Yeah, it definitely is. So maybe we have to back up our corner, maybe I'm driving in too deep, but it definitely plows in, and it moves me up the racetrack a little bit, but coming off the corner feels pretty good. We'll try to do a fast lap here. This track, you're actually turning two thirds of the track. You can steer and go two thirds of the track, which is pretty interesting. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking at my rear view here now and I see smoke coming out of the tire, so obviously it's a uh, pretty bad push in terms of uh, three and four. You know, the other thing I think I'm doing wrong is that my, my, my line for that exit in turn two, my line for exit in turn two is just too low, and, and, and I see that you're arcing a little bit better, which is definitely helping in this condition where the car is just pushing so bad. Yeah, you know, I, um, yeah, like I said, I watched that iRace, or not that racing, the uh, race from earlier this year, and some of them were explaining how to, how to drive the track, including Joey Logano, which he was one of the broadcasters. And he said there's really two ways to attack this track. You can drive in hard, let the car kind of push up the racetrack, which, which is what I was doing, kind of diming, diming it off so you get a good one out of the corner. Or you can drive in a little bit more careful, you know, give it a 
good burst of throttle throughout the corner, and then back it up a little bit, coming out of, you know, four, going through four, and then get back to throttle. So kind of treat it like it's a two-part corner. And, you know, obviously we'll experiment with it more, but right now the car was pushing pretty bad, so I was driving that, that first way, you know, kind of diming it off and driving up the track and then getting a better run out of the corner. Yeah, so um, I want to stop for a second and I guess uh, talk about something a little bit uh, deeper. Um, uh, you know, massively successful right now, and, or at least I know that you're, you're definitely, knowing a race car driver, uh, you're not where you want to be. You're never going to be where you want to be, you know. Uh, yeah. But you can say that you're definitely at a better place than you were last year, and then last year you were at a better place than the year before. But let's rewind a little bit to 2014, because tell me, like this is what I gather from the outside, knowing a little bit about you. That year was probably the most important year out of all of them for your career. And it started out in a weird way. So I think that you have like quite a story that's like uh, really compelling and, and one of those stories about never quitting because it started out really badly. And that was like, how did you feel during 2014? Because you guys were prepared for that, uh, the June sprints was it? And you had a massive crash and your Miata was done for the season. That must have been one of the lowest points in your career. And I think it actually was a good thing. Yeah, you're, you're right. You know, we came off, uh, you know, 2014 with, you know, hopefully we were going to have a better motor. You know, we went through the car, started out the car, Spec Miata. And, you know, Spec Miata is a very competitive class. So, you know, you want to win because that shows just how good of a driver you actually are. So we went to Blackhawk in 2014, which was the first race of the season up here. And we just had issues with the car. And, you know, it wasn't a good way to start the season because, you know, previous years we've had actually some success at the track. And it started out really rough. And then, you know, we went to mid-Ohio. We had more issues. And we went to June Sprints at Road America. And we were just involved in a pretty big wreck on a restart. And basically, you know, we totaled the car. And it was disappointing because we had such high hopes for such a good year. You know, we were working with the new motor builder. We went through the car. You know, we had a good sponsor, True Techs, who's, you know, still a sponsor, but it was just very disappointing, and obviously we never gave up, because look where we are at today. It was just very hard not to, though, because everything seemed to be going wrong. And, yeah. you know, once we pulled that car, you know, we don't have another backup car. You know, my dad and I do all of the own work to our car, and it got to the point where, you know, we were throwing a lot of money at the car, and money, you know, at that point we were still paying for most of our racing out of our own pockets. You know, I worked. Um, I was my dad, and it was just really hard and disappointing and tough, but we toughed it out. We didn't really race much more that year other than, uh, you know, we raced some endurance races. Obviously, you and I raced together in the 25 of the Thunder Hill. And we had bad and luck in that one, too. So, I mean, I know it just seemed like a have, pile of bad luck. Yeah, it was a, um, you know, it was, it was definitely a character-building year for sure. And, you know, moving on to 2015, everything just seemed to turn around, you know, we had some really good finishes in Spec Miata. You know, we, we rebuilt the car, so we did fix the car. It, it was straight as could be after we fixed it. You know, we took it to the body shop. We put a lot of time in the car. We worked with Rossini Racing Motors, which, you know, they gave us a really good competitive motor. And, you know, the whole year, you know, 2014 and 2015 just kind of flopped, turned around. And, you know, we were doing so well in the beginning of the year that Joe Koenig, you know, from Trimtech Travel Products, gave me the opportunity to make my pro racing debut in IMSA. And, you know, we'd go on to lead eight laps. So it was, you know, 2014 was a character-building year. But I think that just goes to show, you know, don't give up, you know, if you have a dream just to keep pursuing it. Because if you're, you know, if you're a hard worker and you put the time in, you know, good things will come. Yeah. Um, and then, but the other thing that it did, though, is that I think had you not been out of a, the car because of the fact that the car was, you know, wrecked and, and, and was still being worked on and all that, that you wouldn't have done all the coaching and everything that you did. Like, your network expanded massively, I think, perhaps more than it would have otherwise, because you, you could have been racing. And on the re race weekends that you would have been in the Spec Miata, you were out there coaching, you were out there meeting more people, you were out there. That, that's, that's experience that, you know, you, you did the best that you could. I mean, that's what you call, you know, making lemonade with the lemons that you were handed. So you were out there at the track anyway. And I think that that seems to really have changed a lot of things because, you know, the opportunities that you've gotten have been, you know, based on on-track performance, but then a bunch of off-track stuff. And um, I guess I wanted to ask you what you think are two, just give me your best, your, what's the best strength that you have 
on track, and then we all know that racing is you know two part things. Like what you do on track and off track. What what are your strengths on track and off track? And then I'm going to tell you what I think that your strengths are. So just give me one on on both. Yeah, I mean, I think I think my strength is just to keep focused and determined no matter what happens. You know, Watkins Glen this year. You know, I made a lot of mistakes on pit road, which cost us a top twenty. And you know, it's tough. But, you know, we went to Mid-Ohio, and obviously we, we showed really well at Mid-Ohio. So I think my strength is just to, you know, keep pursuing it and don't let things get me down, you know. Have the best attitude you can and just be thankful to where you're at because, you know, like you said, you know, 2014 was a character-building year, and without that, maybe I wouldn't have made my pro debut in 2015. And, you know, in 2014, like you said, I did meet a lot of great people off the track because I was coaching, and, you know, a lot of those people still help me to this day. So just, you know... I think it's important to um, obviously have the best attitude you can, no matter what's happening. Um, I'm definitely not, you know, surprised at all by everything that you've been able to do. Uh, like Rania, my wife, you know, we got to meet you uh, and spend, you know, basically almost like an entire week together. And then, you know, yeah. you get to uh, know a lot about a person, and you know, we're definitely not surprised. I think two things uh, on track. Uh, very, very important. Like, you do know how to bring the car back home in one piece. Like, you're a clean driver. You, you, you have that right balance of, like, uh, aggressive, but, you know, patience. Um, it's a massively impressive to be able to bring back the car clean in one piece, especially on ovals in, in the Xfinity series, you know. Um, so I think that's one thing that, that for being as young as you are, that you do have the right amount of, like, patience and aggression and know when to use both. And then off track, I think you're the best network I've ever seen. Like your networking skills are on point and um, that is, you know, huge. Um, I don't know how it is that you do it. I don't know if somebody taught you, but yeah, networking is definitely one of your biggest strengths off the track. Yeah, that's important. You know, there's two parts to being a, a professional race car driver. And, you know, there's, there's drivers who obviously had the best skill who were fast, but weren't very remarkable off the track. And, that just leads to losing sponsors and losing rides. You have to have, obviously, you got to be a good driver and you know bring the car home clean, like you said, which I've been fortunate enough to do. And I think that's why you know BJ McLeod Motorsports keeps bringing me back because I show I can bring a car back. You know, and that's important to a team owner too. You know, you don't want to be rebuild, rebuilding a car. You know, Mid Ohio was it wasn't my fault. It was unfortunate, but I think it's just that type of track. Obviously, it's kind of bound to happen when you're in that when you're in that act. Um, but, you know, teams like BJ McLeod Motorsports, they're not Penske. They don't have a lot of backup chassis. They don't have a lot of guys. They don't have a lot of funds. So they really rely on the drivers to bring the car home clean. But, you know, in regards to um, networking, um, everything is self-taught. You know, I've taught myself everything, and it just started at a young age. You know, I've always wanted to go racing, and I made myself a Facebook page really young. And, you know, just inviting people to like it, you know, meeting sponsors and meeting family and, you know, just having that image on social media that's very important well well you're very good at it um so you're going to be racing at dover this weekend yep uh we wish you all the best uh, Thank you. and and then obviously hopefully making more starts in this series and and i know you probably say this to yourself at the end of every year like how could it how could it get any better but um i hope it continues and uh you know year after year you know it just keeps on getting better for you yeah i've been very blessed every year you know, you were spot on. Every year I tell myself, I don't know how it can get better. You know, from 2015 to now, you know, that's three years. So I think the only way I can get better now is, you know, running more races next year, you know, having better results or even running a full season, which is my goal. You know, I want to find appropriate sponsorship to uh, run a full season and just continue to learn. That's that's my goal, you know, continue to learn. And you do that by running a full season. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, let's get in a, a, just a few more laps of practice. Let's make one more set of adjustments and see if we can get the car a little bit better. All right, well, you're my crew chief, so All right. you tell me what to do. Well, definitely, again, man, I think we didn't go far enough with our adjustments. Let's see, what were, were your hop? At least our pressures got a little bit better balanced, though. My my last time, what did we get our right front up to, like 62 or 64? I can't remember. It's 61 now, uh, though. It was 58, so we ran more laps, obviously. So oh, okay. It's, it's a lot closer, but our, our right front is still – hotter yeah. or um, you know running more pressure so maybe well, we bump that down yeah i agree let's go uh, down a whole pound on that yep. and, and then so go that, up on the right rear maybe up one on the right rear i agree 
So 51 and a half on the right front and 54 and a half on the right rear. Yes. And then do you want to make a chassis uh, track bar jumper too? Yeah, let's let's raise that right uh, rear corner again just a tad. Uh, 9.5. Okay, let's do it. And let's see. I mean, the issue that we're having right now is that, okay, I mean, it's great and more realistic that right now we have both corners of the track behaving really differently. I think I'm a lot happier with the car on the exit of turn four, but really unhappy at the turn two end. So I guess yep. our, our concern is that we don't want to free up the car so much that we're uh, holding on for dear life at the exit of turn four. Yeah, that's that's what you don't want on this track. You know, I've never raced this track, but just watching videos, everyone says that's what you don't want a loose race car, so you have to find the perfect balance, and especially in ovals, you make a lot of time driving into the corner, so hopefully we made that, hopefully we didn't go too much. Okay, let's, let's have you follow me around this time. I can't get away from like not brushing the brakes just a little bit on my entries. Oh, oh. I mean, no, I'll... Did we loosen it up too much? No, I hit the apron. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I did that already once. Uh, after I, I downloaded the track, I, I did a couple laps on it, and yeah, the apron. Yeah. The same thing happened to me. Uh, oh, we learned something. Don't touch yeah, the apron. so I, I don't want to do that this weekend. Definitely not. Alright, so I'm back on track. Let's see if I can run a decent lap. Okay. 
So I'm just gonna head back to the road. So what did you see your cars doing? Well, now now we're in that tricky spot of uh, it's both sometimes pushing, but then sometimes it's a little bit too free. So so I think uh, it requires uh, some other adjustments. If uh, if I was a little bit more experienced at uh, dealing with the stock cars, then I would be checking other little details about like well, what's our right front, uh, what's our splitter height, what's our aerodynamic like um, profile at the moment, or, or is is the aerodynamics of the car set up perfectly or not before going more mechanical. Yeah, I mean, you know, if if I if I'm having an issue now with kind of like overall grip, then it's I, I would like to have be able to have a little bit more downforce then. So can I plant the the, the the car a little bit better? Not necessarily more front downforce, but more overall downforce. Are we riding a little bit too high? Can we get the car into track a little bit more uh, before yeah. that? But since I don't know any of that and I really don't know how to tune it in eye racing. Um, mechanically, we need a little bit more mechanical grip uh, overall, so possibly seeing if... But then it's that long run, uh, short run um, thing. The c tires might be coming up to pressure a little bit too soon, right? You know, maybe just all around. I mean, we, we improved the balance by, by increasing the rear pressure versus the uh, right front, but maybe yeah. all of them need to come down just a tad because um, I think we're, we're getting the tires a little bit too hot too soon. And, and and the car feels a little bit too good, really, on the first lap, right? Yeah, and then it falls off. Yeah, it really should feel a lot worse, and then it should get better, but it, it just gets worse. More or less, right, yeah, more or less right now, it feels like we're almost at a qualifying setup. Yeah. And qualifying pressures. Okay. Um, anybody uh, else that you want to mention, uh, um, sponsorship-wise and everything? Yeah, you know, we've had some great sponsors this year, and... I definitely wouldn't be racing this year if it weren't for, you know, Prevagen, um, Extreme Experience, Trim Tex, you know, CNC Swiss. Those are all guys who have helped me throughout the year. And like I said, you know, and especially Marriott companies. Marriott companies, I wouldn't have been able to make my Cup Series debut at Sonoma without them. You know, it's just kind of one thing leads to another, and another is kind of like a snowball effect. You know, first you have the Cup Series debut, then you race all through road courses, and now we're still doing some oval stuff. So. You know, it just keeps going and progressing, and, you know, hopefully we can finish off the season strong and just keep learning and roll into next year, and hopefully we can, um, you know, keep finding some uh, more great sponsors. Well, we wish you the best luck this weekend, Josh. Thank you so much for uh, being on the show with me. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I, I hope uh, I hope our practice helped out a little bit, and I hope uh, things uh, go better for you. I think it will. I think they for sure will. Thank All you. Right. So we're going to cut some more laps, and then uh, we'll see what happens this weekend. Guys, tune in on uh, TV. It'll be on, what, NBC Sports? Yep, NBC Sports on Saturday. Um, I believe, I don't know the time, actually. I don't know if it's a night race or a uh, day race, but it's uh, NBC Sports Network. Well, look for it, guys, on uh, NBC Sports Network. You'll watch Josh starting in the uh, uh, McLeod. Yep, BJ McLeod, number 78. BJ McLeod, number 78. All right, guys. And there we have it, folks. I hope you really enjoyed that interview. We did uh, some laps around uh, two different racetracks, and, and hopefully I uh, was able to help out Josh a little bit and get him prepared for this weekend's race. I want to remind everybody to tune in. That's this coming Saturday at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. It'll be September the 30th. It'll be the Use Your Melon Drive Sober 200 from Dover International Speedway on NBCSN. Watch Josh Belicki starting in the number 78 BJ McLeod Chevrolet Camaro and uh, wish him some luck. So tune in, support uh, your driver. And also I want to remind you guys, uh, he's also on Instagram and on Facebook. Just look for Josh Belicki and Josh Belicki Racing as well as I am as well. So you can find me on Instagram and Facebook and uh, definitely remember to subscribe to my channel and uh, you can reach me and uh, contact me for anything, you know, feedback on what more other types of videos you want to see and uh, maybe somebody else that you want to see on this show. So uh, talk to me. We can network. Remember, just make sure you hit the like and the subscribe on this video. Uh, until next time, guys.